This is really about being free to create what you want your life to look like. We each are our own hero. And how do we take the challenges that come our way and see those as the birth process of us becoming heroic? Can you meet that judgment that ultimately will surface with neutrality? This is the Wall Street Coach Podcast with Kim Ann Curtin. Aloha, everybody. Just a quick uh, mention that I have a free ebook for our listeners. It's at traderdiscipline.com. The name of the book is Discipline and Finding Your Edge by me, Kim Ann Curtin. This is a picture of that book that you're going to get for free if you sign up on traderdiscipline.com. Now, come on in. We're going to listen to a great interview with Jane Kalina, also known as Airplane Jane. I hope you guys enjoy it. Welcome back, everybody, to the Wall Street Coach Podcast. Today, Lucas and I are very excited to have Jane Galena, also known as Airplane Jane, here as our guest. Welcome, Jane, to the podcast. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Lucas. A pleasure to be here. So great to have you and so great to see you again. I was very fortunate to interview Jane maybe a year and a half ago on the Stocks of Trade podcast. And we stayed in touch ever since. And I am a huge fan of her book. Uh, her book is called FMJ, Trust Transition Trade. It's a book that everybody should read, but especially women who want to be traders because it's really like Jack Schwaker's book of Market Wizards, except featuring all women. And I've reached out to almost all the women that you featured in your book. I became friends with Latoya Smith, who has a great uh, story in your book. And she has also been on our podcast. So the profit room Latoya runs. So Jane, you're amazing at collecting uh, these great stories of other women. But here's Jane's amazing story. So you guys have some context. She started her career in 2000. 15 and has taken the day trading community by storm really ever since she's a loving wife a mother of two and she was seeking control of her financial future while remaining present to her young daughters as a day trader jane has been able to accomplish that dream and she quickly became one of the most successful female day traders under her mentor timothy sykes uh, through her blog, YouTube videos, workshops, and seminars, Jane hopes she can inspire and empower more individuals to break out of their comfort zone and try day trading. Have I left anything out, Jane? Because you have a great bio. With no, someone. you know, I think that's it. I mean, I had my whole life before that <laughs> also brought me to uh, the day trading world, like back in 2000 when the dot-com bubble was just happening i was one year out of school and i picked up and moved to atlanta and i was like i want to move to atlanta and who was hiring brokers right but at that point in time you know i i didn't want to partner with a broker of 25 years and the dot-com bubble imploded so it was my first layoff of my life that actually took me away from the market and then 2014 after finding out that I was being laid off while eight months pregnant, that layoff brought me back to the market. So it's interesting, you know, everybody goes through layoffs and they're not always the worst thing in life. Um, it will help lead you to your passion, which at one point was culinary school and then back to the day trading world. So when it's right, in my opinion, it's going to happen. It's going to bring you back like a, like a homing pigeon, you know, it's just going to make it, you're going to make your way back home. Tell us, uh, I'm familiar with how you got your name, Airplane Jane, tell this community in case they don't know uh, that story because it's so fantastic. Yes. Well, I am a licensed pilot. I got my private pilot's license all the way back in 1996. I am not current. Uh, my husband is a commercial airline pilot. So I leave the flying to him. I've got my hands full with two kids now, five and seven. And it is February 23rd, 2022. My youngest just turned five wow. three weeks ago. Wow. Um, so it, it's a fun time, but they are a handful. And you know, there's only 24 hours in the day and you need to keep current with flying. Uh, and so having that extra time at the moment just isn't possible. Uh, I, I, I give them most of my free time. And uh, once, you know, maybe when they get a little bit older, my best friend is also an airline or a flight instructor. Wow. And so maybe I will have her teach them as well so they can 
be two other pilots in our family. So we'll be a, a family of four pilots, maybe. We'll see. We'll see what happens. But yeah, it was back in 1996 that I did get my license and uh, really motivated me. It actually taught me that I needed to get glasses too, because I was seeing two runways when I was coming down on approach. Wow. And, you know, I thought this, this really isn't good. So maybe I need to go get my eyes checked. And sure enough, I have astigmatisms in both eyes. And wow. so thanks to flying and now we're glasses. <laughs> That's amazing. Wow. It's amazing that that, you know, was not really showing up for you before that encounter. Tell people how you treat so our audience has some context. Tell yeah, us. Yeah, for sure. Well, originally, you know, I did start out with Timothy Sykes with the penny stock model because that's who was out there on the internet when I started learning back in 2015. And then I quickly learned, you know what, risk management wise, this is not for me. Um, taking larger position sizes and looking for a small move was too much risk. So I went more to the larger cap stocks, same size position dollar wise, but smaller share size. So it had a little bit more wiggle room on the risk management side. And so that was easier to handle for me. And then as I expanded, I, I went into researching other female traders, wrote my book and ended up meeting Stephanie Cameron, who is known as the dark pool princess, basically. <laughs> and uh, she and I now work together and I also help to educate other people about the dark pools, which is where those really big guys hide their trades. And you know, it, it is, we don't necessarily know the direction that they're going to go immediately, but when you see billions of dollars in a trade, you know, there's going to be movement, but it's just a matter of patience. Like any sort of trade setup, you have to wait for that to happen. You wait for that higher probability trade of a support or a resistance level to be broken or a trend change. And you go ahead and you follow that really big money. It actually somewhat helps them to have their position, you know, work for them because we wait patiently. And then once it starts to move, if everybody jumps in, guess what? There's more money buying and it takes it to their ultimate destination. Absolutely. And so this was how many years into your trading that the dark pools became a focus for you? Yeah, you know, it really was about 2016 because I was pregnant with my second daughter and actually did all the editing right after she was born. So that's how I think about it in my head. I was doing all the legwork for my book yeah. and then released it June of 2017. So it was back 2016, end of 2016 was when I did my event and that's when it, it all, came together. What is different from 2016 to today about the dark pools, if anything? Right now, well, they've somewhat changed the uh, share size that they use, but really it's just a matter of, hey, if you're seeing a million shares, for example, uh, today we had nice, I'm just looking up here, 900 and uh, let's see here. Hold on. I want to get a, we had an XTN transportation one of 773,000 shares, right? At $85. That's not chump change. So you know that something's going to happen. And sometimes you'll see a major print on an ETF that has, for example, Apple as the number one holding. So it could be somebody that is actually an Apple insider, but they can't trade their own stock. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of a loophole to get outside of that insider trading. Well, if Apple's the number one holding in this ETF, then we can place a trade in it and we're going to ride it up as well as the Apple shares that we own. But we're able to profit privately without violating insider trading. Now, I don't have any evidence that they do this exactly, but it's a great way to creatively get outside of that insider trading because they're trading a basket of stocks instead of just the individual one. Yeah. Well, do you feel that a lot of traders are not as in tune to this as they should be? Well, I think, you know, now after following it for six years, I see 100% the market is manipulated. 
zero doubt in my mind. And crypto, right? We see GBTC prints as well, and then we see Bitcoin move. So I think a lot of newer traders, especially during the time of the pandemic, people got their stimulus money, they were putting it into the market, they were seeing these amazing returns. However, since January, since we've had this downward turn in the market, people have only seen bullish moves for 18 months. They don't necessarily know how to trade a different trend. And so it, oh, let's buy the dip. Mm, no, you're gonna get burned this time. You need to be aware of what's going on. You need to see the trend change. You need to come and learn about the dark pools because we saw them selling up at 475. And I told my husband, this is going to be the biggest stock market crash ever. And it's not just related to the dark pools. It's related to the Fed. It's related to fiat money having a certain time frame of which it is going to have value before the inflation makes it so devalued that it's worthless. Yeah. And so looking at all of these things, it's going to be a mess. And I don't know that people have their seatbelts on for that, uh, you know, the roller coaster ride down. What is it? I don't know. It's like the tower. I don't know, the scare tower or something. I don't yeah, know. I've never been on the, the <laughs> ride that does that, but it's like all of a sudden you sort of have the Drop. weightless experience because it just drops, the floor drops out. Well, that could very easily happen to the market. Uh, seeing major selling, it took only, I think it was 18 days from, it was February 26th or 22nd of 2020 to March 16th was the drop that we experienced back in 2020. I was on vacation, it was great, I had some puts, I was trading by the pool in the Dominican, paying for the vacation, I'm like, honey, look, see, I told you, right? But my husband's like, it's not gonna drop, right? I'm like, honey, the dark pools have sold. Come on, we're below the dark pool prints, it's going down. And so really, seeing the big money movement can make a big difference. I mean, we all know that all the major hedge funds, all of the brokerage houses have obscene amounts of money. And if you can see where it's going, either in or out, you just follow that price action, it's gonna be easier than trying to, oh, okay, yes, you have technical analysis, right? I've been studying CMT. You have technical analysis of stock charts, everything like that. You add in seasonality, you add in, um, sine waves and the cycles and all of that. But the icing on the cake is really the dark pool prints because you get to see the money going in or out. Follow it. You have the technical side to make it easier. But then, you know, all right, hey, gold could be shooting up $700, right? Silver. I just did a uh, stock charts presentation, Your Daily Five today all about silver stocks. They are amazing setups right now. All of the physical silver stocks look fantastic. And physical silver in your hand too, in case banks get shut down like Trudeau did to the truckers, right? You, you've gotta have some cash and physical assets on hand always because you never know what's going to happen. And it's really important that, hey, if the banks were to do something, if a bank were to have a cyber hack, and have to shut down for a week. Do you have cash on hand, a emergency stash that you're prepared to take care of yourself and your family, right? Yeah. So seeing all of this has really taught me that, hey, it's not necessarily just the market that's manipulated, could be a bit more of what goes on in the world as well. Yeah, yeah. Lucas, I think you went to ask something. Yeah, a couple of things there. I mean, one is... Um, Did I pique your, pique your interest there, Lucas? <laughs> no, it's, uh, you reminded me a few, a few months ago, we had uh, Jim Rogers on, and he was saying similar things. He was talking about how, you know, he was like, I don't know when it's going to happen. This was back in September, I believe, but he was like, you know, we have, we're definitely in a bubble. And he's like, we're, this is going to be like one of the, when we're in a bear market, it will almost certainly like, be one of the worst that we have just because of the inflation. Um, and he was also talking about gold and silver back then. So yep. <laughs> yeah, you go. 
It's good to be in line with uh, Jim Rogers, I think. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. I, I, maybe I need to chat with him. <laughs> yeah, I was also do. thinking the idea of, um, you know, your, it's the idea of risk management is uh, essentially what you're, a lot of what you're talking about. And uh, I feel like is a big part of maybe the way you live your life, but I'd love for you to just talk about that. Yeah, definitely, Lucas. You know, as a trader, once you become disciplined with your risk management, in trading, it does overflow into the rest of your life for sure. Um, you know, we I have a solar powered flashlight, for example, or solar powered lamp that we lost power for six hours. My husband's like, ah, what are we gonna do? I was like, hold on, I got the solar powered flashlight. Here we go, or lamp. And I was like, see, I already all set, I'm prepared, right? And I saw everything happening with the first lockdowns with the prints back in March of 2020. And I said, you know what, honey, I, I feel the market feels weird. We're getting weird, weird prints. I think they're going to shut down the world just like they did in China. So I'm going to go and stock up. So I already had a month worth of food before they shut down just because it, the market has an energy, just like everything. Yeah. And when that energy changes, you can feel when the market is acting abnormal. We can see when we have a lot of prints and we know, um, okay, spidey senses, the neck on the hairs on the back of your neck go up and it's, yeah. hold on, I need to be prepared because something is abnormal and something's about to happen. You don't necessarily know what, but sometimes we get oil prints literally two days later, a drone attack. Um, and so you know, you end up feeling the energy of the market and when it's off and hey, yeah, who, who wouldn't want to have an extra week worth of, of cash, right? For that what if scenario with how crazy the world has been, how crazy the weather has been, right? Why wouldn't you want to have a couple extra weeks of food just in case? Because, hey, the way that everything has been going, it's only smart, right? And I think that is the risk management aspect of life, looking at it as let me just be prepared, not necessarily thinking the worst, but right. as a mom and you know having a household of four, I need to be prepared yeah. so that if something were to go wrong, we have what we need. Yeah, for sure. Jean, tell us about your own development because we talk so much at the Wall Street Coach about emotional intelligence and how we feel that's, you know, the, the kind of the last piece that a trader considers as they are becoming more sophisticated or more experienced. I find that sometimes they keep that last on the list of what they need to be focused on. Tell us just about your own reconciliation with emotional intelligence and what and your relationship to it now. Yeah, well, it's a great question because most traders, when they get into trading, I think just look at it as dollar signs, right? And then they quickly go, hold on a second, I know nothing, right? <laughs> I see that people make, oh yeah, Wall Street bets, so yeah, GameStop, it went to 300, I got DWAC, it went to 300, 175, I got this. And then they go, wait a second, I need to educate myself more, right? There's more to it than just this. And a lot of personal demons will come out in your own trading. Everybody has a different past. Everybody has a different personality. And so those personal demons of self-control or cutting losers, you know, what decision-making, patience, they all come up. And it's, I'd say about 15% technicals. Yeah, you can educate yourself there, but 85% emotional intelligence and, um, and knowing yourself, feeling when you're off, feeling when your head is not there. Uh, you know, like I've mentioned that my dad isn't doing that well right now. I know that that means that my mind is preoccupied. I don't necessarily need to be in day trades. I could be in longer swing trades that are just sort of position trades. I can monitor it. I don't need to be babysitting the market every single minute in the morning and going, hey, it, ah, and make a bad decision because my thought is somewhere else. So I think that comes with experience. Um, and usually most traders, I'd say anywhere from six to nine months, 
start to really feel that. They have to see a couple earning seasons. They have to understand what happens during earnings season. Oh my goodness, why is this dropping when it had great earnings? Oh yeah, that was for guidance is saying they're not going to produce, right? So maybe that's going to be an issue with the pricing. Bottom line is the dark pool's running it. They probably sold two weeks earlier and hey, they're dropping it even further because they'd like to get it in a bargain, right? Who doesn't like a bargain? So, so yeah, funny. I think it's experience is the biggest thing that new traders, you can't get them. They can read till their heart is content, but you have to experience the market and experience that energy. Understand it's not straight up. It's not straight down. It's the staircase, right? It's going to go staircase up and staircase down. Well, maybe elevator when there's, right. <laughs> when there's a, a, a <laughs> massive crash that's happening. But usually it's, yeah. it's going to be experience that they need to experience. They can't rush that. You just can't rush experience. Some traders I'm talking to are talking, you know, they're having to rejigger their trading pattern, their trading style right now. Uh, how many times have you had to do that? And what are, what are the pros to that? And what are the cons to that? Well, I think one of the best benefits um, with the dark pools is not predisposing myself to a long bias or a short bias. It's, hey, here is the potential if it goes above this price. Here's the potential if it goes below this price. And being prepared either way. I, I have a watch list on my website that I put out every single day. And it's these stocks that are moving. There's lots of volatility and volume, what you need for a great day trade. But I'm going to look at the levels rationally. I'm going to say if it goes above here, great. It's a nice potential long. If it goes below, great. A nice potential short. If it doesn't go outside of that range, hey, it's a no trade. So it's, and I think that came with learning the dark pools in saying, all right, when the big money is moving it up, it's gonna go up. I just need to be patient and wait. I think a lot of people might lack that patience mm -hmm. in that good trade entry. Yeah. It's, oh my where goodness, does, this is moving up, yeah. Where does that patience come from for you, Jane? Uh, I don't, maybe it comes from my two girls, <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, really, because, I don't know. Maybe that could be it. Or it could be, I found that I've also run four marathons, right? And in running a marathon, it's baby steps. Mm -hmm. It is slowly training a little bit every day. And actually, the first one I ran was in Hawaii. It was in Honolulu. Yeah. Oh, my God. That's amazing. Yeah. And so really training every day, being diligent, but taking it little chunks at a time and knowing that you can achieve your goal slowly but surely. You do a little bit of action today to make your future dream happen, you're gonna arrive there. Yep. But it's not instantaneous, and I think potentially the millennial generation might not have that patience. You know, Facebook, our phones, all are instantaneous. It's for instant gratification. Mm -hmm. And learning a lot of new things, no matter what it is, usually isn't going to be instantaneous. You have to give it that time. When you talk to traders and you do your workshops, I know that you uh, this weekend have a uh, workshop and you're going to specifically be talking about the dark pools. Uh, and that, by the way, guys, is something that's going to be available after this weekend. So if you see this at any time, you can go to Jane's site, which we'll give you in the line of notes uh, for you to go and buy it. But just out of curiosity, what is it you say to traders when they come into your workshops and you can tell or sniff that they're impatient? How and what do you point them towards to develop it? I think the best thing is saying to practice on paper first, right? Practice, for example, the first 15 minutes of the day, yeah. after being in the brokerage world, also, you know, being in New York, I see the, the train station in your background, makes yeah. me think of when a commuter train is going first thing in the morning, the doors, it pulls into the station, the doors open, 
It's a mad rush. People are getting in, people are getting out. Guess what? That's market open, right? You have orders stacked up all throughout the night and you've got new people that have seen the price action in the morning. They're ready to jump in on it as well. And so once that sort of calms down, plus you also have margin calls. Yeah, you've extended your margin, so we're either going to force you out or we need you to close this out. So you've got all these people right at the beginning of the day, massive volume, just sort of let it calm down. Yeah. Also, options are crazy with the IV and the premium. Why would you want to get in there? right? So you want to wait till everything calms down, a direction is set, see if the trade setup is there, and then jump in. But people, again, have to experience that. They, they are going to burn themselves if they don't have that patience. And the best way to learn it is on paper first, rather than burning through their hard-earned money, which I think is probably the biggest mistake because people say, oh, it's easy, I got this. Yeah. Yeah, the easy, I got this. Uh, I think the previous two years facilitated that illusion. Mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely, definitely. And you've got these die hard, as they say, ape army with AMC that are expecting it to be DWAC or GameStop, but it will never be because of the size of the float. They don't understand the concept of that supply and demand that's out there. You've got 500 million shares in AMC and you have 68 million, I believe it is, for GameStop and 28 million for DWAC. ACY has 700,000 shares. So you look at these lower floats and yeah, they, they're life changing, good or bad if you're on the right side of the trade. But if you're talking about somebody getting into a larger float stock, larger supply, it's not going to have that same movement, especially if the really big money is going against it. They are going to outnumber the little guys always. Yeah. What do you feel you see coming for crypto? You talked a little bit about it before. Talk about your experience, your relationship to crypto now, if you're willing to share. Oh yeah, no, definitely. I, we are 100% going to a digital banking system, digital financial system, and it has all been in the works for years. Um, in fact, I was just doing more research. So this weekend I'm talking about uh, the metaverse, really what is that? Mm -hmm. Also NFTs, how people can create them, how they can monetize them. I'm going to actually mint one live for everybody so they can see just how easy it is. And then also the digitization of stocks, tokenizing these stocks and where to find them. So it's not just that, hey, we're already dealing with digital money. We're dealing with digital fiat money right now. Are we going to go to a new asset backed financial system? In my opinion, yes. I think we are definitely going there and it's more than just central bank digital currencies. Um, you know, we've had this ripple lawsuit going on for over a year now and they just released information from the sec on friday that was saying oh yeah back in 2015 we said that it wasn't a security so they had that evidence in the sec paperwork in their discovery that they released so it's not a question but it's going to set a precedent mm -hmm. for the rest of the crypto space and the big reason is that Brad Garlinghouse came out and said, I want to solve a problem for the Fed. I want to solve this slow, antiquated, swift system, right? Because that takes three days for an international wire. Well, guess what? Crypto, instantaneous. PayPal, MoneyGram, they're already on blockchain technology. PayPal has eliminated the swift system. People don't even realize it. It's already there. Yep. And when we have Boris Johnson and Biden coming out saying, we're going to cut Russia out of the SWIFT system. Guess what? The new ISO 20022 banking standard was set to go into effect this quarter. It's antiquated and is going away anyways. They're not doing anything. In fact, they're saying, guess what? The US dollar and the UK dollar are now worthless. Excuse me the British pound, are now worthless to Russia because we're not letting them into our system. But it doesn't do anything. It's already, it's all electronic. It's already in place. 
everybody has the ability to send money internationally within seconds. And it's just implementing this banking standard 100%. And there are going to be five, six different major networks that will be used in that new uh, banking standard. And then we're going to see that the stock market is going to go to blockchain technology. There is going to be, there's not going to be the trade date plus two days for settlement because they don't need that. That was set up when the banks were really slow. Everything was done on paper. You had to go through a transfer agent. It's all digital. It's all instantaneous. There's no reason for that now, except the brokers and the banks can play with the money. That's right. So this is now going into the favor of the people yeah. and allowing blockchain. You can see with the open source blockchain, you can see on the actual blockchain transactions, everything that happens. I saw them creating and burning USDC because we have a crypto room as well called Crypto Tunities. And I keep something up called the uh, crypto bubbles. And so on crypto bubbles, it will show you the way I have it set is the largest volume. Well, it will show you the volume for the day. We'll show you the size of the bubble and then the color, whether it has moved up or down. Well, one day I'm sitting here and it's market close. I look and the entire screen just blows up and shows USDC. Well, this is weird. Then I look at the volume, $81 trillion worth. Okay, that, that's pretty much like the stock exchange value for NASDAQ and um, New York Stock Exchange together. So I was like, this is, this is weird. 15 minutes later, it shrinks. I'm like, all right, I have to do some investigating on this. Yeah. So I went into Etherscan, I did the research, I looked at it. Yes, they were creating the USDC coin, transferring it, and then burning it. So in other words, feels like they were testing a new banking system wow. or a new system to transfer it and testing these outlets of yeah. where they're going to send it. And that happened for about three or four days. Shoot. And it was, it was mind blowing to me. I'm like, how can people not see this? Like they're, they're testing the system right now. I know that it's going to happen because I see it with my own eyes. I see it in the blockchain. I see the data. And so to me, there's no doubt whatsoever. And that's part of the workshop is I found the digital stock tokens. Let me see. Talk, Let me about, open that. It. Talk about that. This, yes. This, 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 well, I can't. I'm not going to spoil it for no, everybody. Of course that, not. Yeah. Of course not. <laughs> but I feel comfortable sharing. Yeah. Yeah. So right now, I mean, we have, I found them for, let's see, how many different countries? Over, I think probably 50 different countries. Australia, Austria, Brazil, Canada, China, um, Netherlands, England, Finland, France, Germany, Hong Kong, Ireland, India, Indonesia, Israel, Italy, Japan, Kuwait, Luxembourg, Malaysian market, not, let's see, New Zealand, Norway, Philippines, Qatar, Russia, Singapore, South Africa, Sri Lanka, Switzerland, Taiwan, UAE, UK, US, and then particularly for minerals, gems, wines, and indexes around the world. So I'm like, ah, I found it. Oh my gosh, this is so exciting. I mean, I'm getting like 100 million tokens for 10 cents. And they've already grown in value up to $1.50. Not much right now, but we haven't had that transition, yep. right? We haven't had that transition just yet. We've also seen that Visa, MasterCard, they are already connecting with different networks. And so it's not a matter of if this is happening, it's kind of like saying, well, I would never see music go from a record player to streaming, right? right. It's a matter of when. Yeah. And I think we're just at the precipice of this happening because they are literally loading these tokens daily. and it's started actually if when i look back at the xlm network xlm was developed in 1970. incredible so this has been around for a long time i started doing more research on vr it was started back in 1960s yeah. 
Like this isn't new information. It's just that it's being presented to the public now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. What What is your suggestion to traders who are listening to this, perhaps having their minds a little bit blown or a lot blown? What is you, how would you point them for the, what's next? What's next in which sense? As far as the market, as far as banking? I would say with them, their own specific trading, right? I'm sure there's plenty of styles that are very different that are listening to us, but considering all that you're speaking about, it sounds to me like this is something they have to become well-versed in around just the digitalization of really everything. So yeah. where do they begin? Well, I think the biggest thing is, like I said, we're already dealing with digital fiat currencies. We're already dealing with it around the world. And many people might say, oh my goodness, you know, yeah, I, I know crypto, I know of it, but I don't have any crypto, right? It's not that hard. You know, if you've ever opened up a bank account online, guess what? It's the exact same thing as opening up a crypto exchange account. However, what you do need to think about, right? When we look at, well, so my first step would be get comfortable with crypto. It's here to stay. It's not going to disappear. Maybe Bitcoin's going to go to zero, which I think it will. Um, but as far as, cryptos it's here it's just going to look a little different you're not necessarily going to be say it's going to be a digital us dollar potentially versus a physical one there will be a time in which we're going to transition everything but it's hard to go completely digital around the world yeah. when people haven't adopted it yet so we're going to go through that adoption phase probably for the next three years so just start getting comfortable with it. If you want to be at the forefront of these tokenized stocks, start educating yourself. Check out my workshop because yes, I'm going to exactly. show you step by step. I actually have screenshots opening up an account, how to go to the asset, how to add the asset, how to purchase the asset so that it is made super simple for people that might be overwhelmed in getting into crypto it's not that hard it really isn't it's hey here's your email address okay what's your password nice okay a little bit of know your client information potentially send in your driver's license photo so that they have that know your client this is who you are same information that you need for a bank account right so mm -hmm. this is just the crypto exchange and something that i want to remind people is when you purchase crypto right if you purchase it on the exchange it is good to store it in a wallet right you wouldn't necessarily just go to the bank hey give me a hundred euros i'm going to leave it here in the bank that's not going to do you any good you want to have it in a wallet and when you look at banks now right when you look at banks now the federal reserve has run the market since March of 2020. They have four different tools that they can use to stimulate the economy. And the reserve requirements is one of them, right? You have the federal reserve rates, you have the interest rate on reserves uh, that the banks have. You also have the open market committee buying and selling of the bonds. And then you have the reserve requirements that the banks are meant to have on hand. So. When we look back at what happened, they turned the reserve requirements into zero. Before with fractional banking, it would usually be anywhere from three to 10% that they had to have on hand with reserves. Yeah. So back in March of 2020, the bank reserves went to zero, which means when your hard earned paycheck goes in digitally, right? Cause it's already digital. It goes in digitally with your direct deposit, that's digital. The bank now has control of it. If everybody went and said, I want my money, please, they don't have it. They've lent it out. And so you want to have control of your crypto. So what you want to do is you want to transfer that out to your crypto wallet, whether it's a soft wallet, meaning 
an app on your phone or an app on your computer, or a hard wallet, which would give you that extra layer of password protection with a physical, somewhat USB looking device. And a caution, make sure that you check that that hard wallet is going to hold your crypto, right? Because I bought a Trezor wallet to hold my XRP and they didn't have the application on the Trezor wallet, so I had to get a Nano wallet. Wow. So I speak from experience, just make sure. Good. That's <laughs> perfect. That's, that's great advice, especially that you went through it personally. And, and you're clearly well-versed in this. So if, if it can happen to somebody as well-versed as you, it could certainly happen to somebody else. Lucas, any follow-up questions? Look yeah, like I guess I, I had no idea we would uh, even be venturing down the road of crypto in this conversation, so I'm excited. Uh, but I'm wondering, you know, um, where, when did, I guess let's, if we can get like your crypto origin story, um, you know, where did you become interested um, and how has it grown over the years? Yeah, I think it really started back in 2017 when we started to see all of them really explode. Sure. Um, and then I just bought a, some crypto and I just forgot about it. Like, you know, yeah. I, I, I put, parked it in an exchange, right? And then I went to go find it and I was like, man, my crypto wallet or my crypto was hacked. I had it with Bittrex. I couldn't find it. I was like, oh, man, but with anything with crypto, right? If it's really speculative and you have not read the white paper, meaning sort of the business plan for that project, then my viewpoint is put in right now what you are willing to say it will go to zero, right? With any sort of investment, you have to be aware that it could go to zero. Do I personally think that all cryptos will go to zero? No, but about 95% of them will. So you have to be aware of that. that there's over 10,000 different uh, cryptos out there. They also lump NFTs in there because they are also on the networks as well. So looking at it that way, I, I parked it there. I didn't, I was like, man, I can't find it. Well, it ended up that Bittrex ended up going to Bittrex International. So all I had to do was just reinitiate my password. Ding! It was like Christmas. I was like, oh, I found my crypto. I'm so excited. <laughs> this was back again when it started rising and I made a nice little profit. So I just sat on it and I was, I was excited about it. And then really almost a year ago, when my girls were on spring break, I started to do much more research. We'd already had Bitcoin that had broken out from 14,000. And I was on Ticker Talker at the time and I was talking about it. I'm like, this is going to continue going up. You know, this is the low float of the crypto space with 18 million coins. And then I started to really look at the ISO 20022 coins and where they were going and reading the research on it. I think I've totally, in this, time of the pandemic i have not done much travel exploration but i've done a lot of digital exploration mm -hmm. and research mm -hmm. and I, that was what was at my fingertips so that's what i could do and i learned a lot about crypto really over the past year and in the past goodness three months now really about the the tokenization of stocks um, and where they are and it's so exciting but it's you know it has to be a fit for people right just like there's people that are passionate about cars right they will go and they will do all sorts of research about cars like trust me i know way too much about cars not because i want to but because my husband is a car aficionado and i will sit there i'll be talking about torque and horsepower and instantaneous yeah. torque because of electricity or electric motors and stuff and anyway when someone is passionate, it becomes easy to re yeah. research it. Totally. And the more that I uncover, the more that I'm like, this is where we're going. This, and I see it. I see the, the transactions of setting up, for example, looking at USDC, where they were creating and burning and trying to expose that to other people so that it's not something you would see unless you watch the crypto bubbles every day, like me. Uh, and then it, it just sort of happened, you know, I, I fell into it, I should say. Yeah. yeah. You are, you are like a detective. That's yeah. <laughs> just constantly looking for, for people's footprints. And <laughs> yeah. A digital detective. Watch out. I'm coming. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's right. You definitely are. But I think if I'm to sum that quality up, it's 
curiosity. Yeah. Just seem to have an insatiable amount of curiosity. And that allows you to be really open to uh, unexpected pieces of information. That's it. And not, you know, in being a follower of the dark pools, not ruling anything out. Mm -hmm. Because I've seen how things happen. Sometimes, like I was saying, with Biden and Boris right now, talking about eliminating Russia out of the SWIFT system. Guess what? It's already being done. Like they're not, they're just sharing it with the public now. So that makes me actually believe that we're that much closer to seeing all of these digital changes happen in the banking system and in the stock market. Yeah. But that, that curiosity and open mindedness, and even I want to speak to the intuition that you rely on when you talk about the vibe of the market, that it has an energy that there are these kind of spidey senses that you pick up on. Uh, there's, there's something about that, Jane, that feels like it's your secret, you know, superpower. <laughs> Maybe not so secret. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's just being in front of it. You know, you, you get to see normal patterns. The stock market does have patterns, right? Computers create patterns, traders create patterns. And seeing an anomaly in the patterns is what stands out. And knowing when there is an anomaly, you become aware of it. And then you go, wait a second, this isn't right. Like if every day, you know, a UPS truck turned right at the corner and then one day it turned left, you're like, well, why did it turn left today? You know, oh, there was construction. Okay, there you go, right? But right you're going to see these things time and time again and being present and experiencing it will give you that ability to say something's off yeah for sure why don't more women become traders jane i think it is a mental stigma kim you know i think a lot of like have you gone out and continued with your paper trading since last time when I we took, talked? I took one trade on Mara almost, what, a year ago, yeah. and, uh, and I made a little profit, and I was like, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, a lot of women might think, hey, it's a men's game, but really the market doesn't matter, it, or they don't, it, the market doesn't care yeah. if you are male or female. Yeah. Uh, women tend to be more risk averse and protect their capital more um, they might have a bit more of a difficult time getting into it and trusting their decision making based on just who they are, but they already budget in life. Like women tend to be more budgeters. Yeah. They tend to say, this is how much I can spend. This is what I can do. And so when you look at it, that's a risk management aspect of life that can carry over into trading fairly easily. It's just applying what you already know to the trading world. Yeah. And moving forward from there but so there's some amazing female traders i mean you, you hear now about kathy woods she's the big name that's always out there almost daily yep. Yep. in in the uh, stock market world and so it's not just a men's club but i think a lot of women don't think of themselves as traders maybe because they haven't been exposed to it yep um, it's possible. that's part of what i love about what you did with fmj and what you do just by being a trader, you know, you, you're showing women that it is possible. And if I wasn't running my business, I probably would go to trading, but I'm, I'm in too deep now, Jane, to, to spend another 20 hour day learning. That's what I feel like. What stops me from becoming a trader is time. The, it is a time commitment. And I think even I could tell over these past two years with the exposure to the day trading community, increasing you know a hundredfold for me that that time commitment is not something i was going to be able to afford to give it and it, anybody who thinks it's quick or easy or or at least this past two years has probably misled a few people i was like this is not this is not easy people <laughs> this is not going to happen in a minute it's going to take a little bit of time and a commitment to that time which you have to be willing to pay Definitely, definitely. But at the same time, if somebody wanted to learn, there's some amazing tools. Like there's TradingView has the ability to replay. So does Thinkorswim. 
So you can go back and you can study the market when the market isn't open. Yeah, it's you're going to know the results, right? You're going to it's like reading the last page of a book when you open it up and then you go, oh, "Okay, well I know what the ending is." But you're going to be able to study it and you're going to be able to study the price action and, and that I think is what really launched me was when I started to really study the price action. I said, I'm going to sit here every day. I'm going to sit here at open. I'm going to track these stocks. I'm going to see what they do. And then you get that feel. So it is possible even for people. And there's markets all around the world. And there's the crypto market. That is 24 seven. So you don't, but caution with that because sometimes people call it crypto crack because they don't sleep. So just be careful. <laughs> Don't get yourself hooked on crypto crack. <laughs> no, no kind of crack is good. <laughs> well, before we wrap up, I'm just going to do a quick reminder to our listeners to please subscribe to our YouTube channel and to keep an eye out for March 1st because I'll be doing a Twitter space with the VWAP Trader One, which is known as JJ and All Day Ray. Uh, and we're really excited about that. So comment and listen to us on March 1st. Jane, what is your parting advice to those traders that are listening to you now? Perhaps you've encouraged or excited them about paying more attention to the dark pools, and I'm sure crypto as well. Is there anything that we didn't address that you want to make sure you speak to? Uh, well, if anyone ever has any questions, I am pretty personable. You can always email me too at jane at cjntrade.com. But, you know, don't be scared of it. Don't be scared to learn something new. The biggest thing that holds anybody back in life is fear and usually fear of failure. But if you're practicing on paper, just try it. Practice it until you start to have success. That is, you know, if you're six out of eight weeks successful on paper, there's a good chance that when you transfer over into real capital, you will still have that success. Just stay small on your positioning, whether it is cryptos or whether it is trading stocks. Just practice small in the beginning and then slowly you'll find your stride, but don't fear it. You know, it's a, a lot of our hurdles are created in our head. And once we get rid of that, head barrier, then it's just a matter of learning and, and soak it up like a sponge. Don't be scared of what's to come and uh, get ready for the crypto revolution. Exactly. Are you going to do another book? Is there a FMJ part two coming in the future? You know what? I had this whole idea that I wanted to create like a documentary about it. Wow. But you know what? That's a lot of time, right? There's only 24 hours in the day. I get eight hours of sleep and I've got my kids. So it it's on the to-do list but it's not a priority right at the moment um i was like yeah i'm gonna create this netflix documentary i got this it's all in my brain and i it, it's still in my brain you know <laughs> that's where yeah. it is for now and then one day yes but yeah. right now i think uh, the crypto revolution is more what i'm focusing on right at the moment and really wanting to share that with people so that they're comfortable with it and that everybody can profit. I think that's probably the, the best thing is helping others to prosper as well and change their own lives that's rather cool. than just saying, hey, I've got this information. I'm not going to tell you what it is. And I don't want you to, to be prosperous because when I prosper, you prosper, we all prosper together. And that's just the best thing ever. I'm with you, sister. I'm with you. We're going to, of course, put all of Jane's social media in the liner notes, but especially her YouTube channel is Airplane Jane carpe profit did i get it right you got it you got it that's right. right yeah carpe profit don't don't let the market take away your profits go ahead and seize that profit lock it you know <laughs> right lock it in lock exactly. it exactly don't want if that was one of my worst things when i was a brand new trader it goes up yeah and it goes down and I did nothing and I did I was a deer in headlights so oh. I speak from experience there too <laughs> Well, that's good. All the lessons you've learned, you're going to help everybody else not have to make those lessons with a big high cost. So yeah. thank you for coming on this podcast. Thank you for the contribution you are to so many traders. Uh, and just thank you for being just a person who really is practicing curiosity and patience. Uh, that's what I'm walking away with in this conversation with you. So thank you for the emphasis on that.
Oh, thank you, Kim. And thank you, Lucas. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Our pleasure too. Hope to see you soon. Thank you guys for watching the Wall Street Coach Podcast. And we hope we will see you again. Aloha for now. This is the Wall Street Coach Podcast with Kim Ann Curtin. You can download Kim's free ebook, Discipline and Finding Your Edge at TraderDiscipline.com and learn more about working with Kim and her team at TheWallStreetCoach.com. And if you're feeling generous, please leave a rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for listening.